The 222 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. From that moment in December five years ago when Qatar was awarded the 2022 World Cup, there have been critics calling for the Gulf state to be stripped of its right to host football's biggest tournament. Qatar has since faced allegations of corrupt practices during the bid process. FIFA, the sports governing body, commissioned an investigation into all the countries involved in bidding for the 2018 and 2022 World Cups. Headed by American lawyer Michael Garcia, a summary of his findings, as presented by FIFA, cleared Qatar of any serious wrongdoing, but the lawyer later resigned and recanted the report. But those are not the only concerns for Qatar. The country is accused of exploiting workers and of still not having the required stadium cooling technology that would make a summer World Cup possible. The organisers of the World Cup have responded by developing a charter they say is meant to ensure the well-being of all their workers. It's supposed to protect them against forced labour, for example, and make sure their wages are paid on time. But there are still complaints. Amnesty International, in a report published in November, said that while workers were living in high-quality accommodation, there were issues with their overtime payments and some workers weren't in possession of their passports. They also said several promises by the government to change the labour rules here have still not been implemented or published. This despite a report six months earlier by the UN Human Rights Council urging Qatar to step up efforts to prevent human rights abuses. We'll talk about all this with the man in charge of the Qatar 2022 World Cup, Hassan Al Thawadi, as he talks to Al Jazeera. Hassan Al Thawadi, Secretary General of the Qatar 2022 Supreme Committee, thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera. The 2022 World Cup, it must be one of the most talked about sporting events that is yet to happen, um, still seven years away. It's been with you now for five years. In that time, have you ever had any doubts that that World Cup wouldn't be coming to Qatar? Uh, no. You know, the simple answer to it is no. Uh, we've always been confident about our position. We've, uh, despite the criticisms that started early on, uh, despite the uh, despite the allegations that came early on, we've always been confident about our position and uh, the way we held ourselves during the bid and after the bid. When the FIFA president, Sepp Blatter, says comments as he occasionally does that perhaps awarding the World Cup to Qatar was a mistake, that's not very helpful for you, is it? How does that make you feel? I think, again, it's the statement and what's made in context. Uh, for us, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the World Cup coming to Qatar was the right choice. Uh, during the bidding stage, uh, when we bid, the messages that we delivered, the concept of the World Cup in Qatar was a unique concept. I mean, if you look at it from the different perspectives, one, it's a compact World Cup. We are talking about being able to host a World Cup where players, fans, FIFA official, m officials, media officials uh, have the ability to follow one more, more than one match a day, see one match a day. Uh, not worry about significant travel time or actually the hassle of the logistics of traveling long distances to follow teams. You're talking about uh, a modular concept for legacy purposes whereby the stadiums uh, will be developed into two tiers, permanent seating and modular seating. The modular seating will be taken out after the World Cup to satisfy the capacity required for Qatar football, or Qatar's football demands. And the modular seats will be reconfigured into smaller seats and donated to football uh, developing nations. So thereby you achieve two goals. One, you contribute to football development. Two, you don't leave any white elephants within uh, the state of Qatar in terms of infrastructure. Uh, three, uh, the simple fact of the cooling technology that we introduced and we are committed to, again, regardless of when the World Cup will be held, we're committed to developing the cooling technology, which serves a function outside of, or has an application outside of uh, the uh, hosting major events. It's got a much wider application that can actually you know, be involved within society or be uh, utilized within society. And the uh, t we actually implemented two successful models uh, during the 2014 Brazil World Cup for the cooling technology. Uh, of course, there's other aspects as well uh, during the bidding stage where we uh, promoted, for example, Qatar's location. We are, relative to other bidding nations, centrally located, which meant that 3.2 billion viewers could follow the World Cup matches uh, during primetime viewing. At the same time, it was easily accessible from different parts of the world, so fans could access Qatar from any part of the world. 
Uh, and of course, the for me, the most important message that was to be that, that we delivered during the bid, and people recognized, it was time for the Middle East to host a major world, uh, major event, and it was time for the Middle East to host an event that has the ability to unify people, that has the ability to deliver the positive messages, such as the World Cup. There is no other event in the world, in my personal humble opinion, that has that unifying capability, that unifying ability. We said it in 2010, and I think when we fast forward to five years, and we're here in 2015, I think considering where currently uh, the, the globe is generally, I think we need to focus much more on unifying platforms, and the World Cup in the Middle East is probably one of the major unifying platforms available. One of the issues that's been there since 2010 is exactly when this World Cup will take place. The FIFA task force is on its way to Qatar later this month. We're expecting a final decision uh, from FIFA in March. Are you looking forward to having some closure on that issue? Absolutely. I mean, of course, you know, once the decision is made, it's always a lot, uh, it's a lot, always a lot more, uh, it's a lot quieter at the very least. So absolutely, we're looking forward to the decision, whatever the decision that the football community decides. We've always said we will abide by it and we're committed to it. Is a Summer World Cup feasible in Qatar? Since the first days of the bid, we've always said it, a Summer World Cup is feasible in Qatar, absolutely. But again, whatever the football community decides, we will be fulfilling. Um, to the extent that it changes to, you know, if the decision is made to change it to the winter, our commitments towards cooling technology and the legacy that it leaves behind is still strong and we will still fulfill that promise. What's your preference? For me, my preference is whenever the football community decides, it is the preference because it gives a certainty as to what we need to do or what the kind of the steps needed to uh, take towards delivering the World Cup. Um, currently, we have uh, our plans are moving forward as you know, with the assumption that the World Cup will be held in the summer. Once the decision is made, when the World Cup will be will be uh, held, we will be able to. Uh, I won't say dramatically change, but rather tinker with part of our plans to ensure that we actually fulfill the requirements at the time that the World Cup is being held. One of the other key issues that Qatar and indeed the whole Gulf region is facing and will become a bigger issue as we get closer to this World Cup is, is the rights and conditions our workers have on World Cup projects. As somebody who's looking after a sporting project effectively, do you think it's right that you also have an obligation, a moral and social obligation to those workers? Let's start off by saying, plain and simple, I think every individual and every human being has a moral and social obligation towards their fellow human beings. Second point is, sporting events, in particular World Cups, Olympics, have an ability to create positive change, have an ability to accelerate positive change and be catalysts towards moving forward and developing. And accordingly, uh, considering that this is the first World Cup in the Middle East, there's a lot of, of, of uh, elements that uh, we're confident will lead to positive change. Uh, the workers' conditions is, uh, I'm, I'm, is one of them, uh, is one that will reinforce, further reinforce and accelerate the commitments that the government's already made, that other stakeholders within the state of Qatar have already made, such as Qatar Foundation, Qatar Rail, and so on. So I believe that the World Cup is, is, is a positive catalyst a series of reforms were announced last year, um, crucially to the much talked about kafala system, the sponsorship system, which sees workers um, often legally tied to their employers, makes it potentially very difficult for them to leave the country. But those reforms are yet to be brought in as law here in Qatar. The, the change generally that, that uh, people focus on and when you talk about workers' welfare addresses, I believe, three elements of, of, of society and government generally. You're talking about an economic, a social, and a legal change. Now, any change that encompasses all three takes its time. And for you to make sure that the change is not only enforceable, but sustainable for the long term, it requires time to actually be implemented. This is nothing new. Every legislation, every country that imposes legislation or introduces legislation into the community, uh, or even signs conventions and then ratifies them, Rarely does it ratify them within six months or within a year from when it actually signs these conventions or introduces these laws. It takes a time because you need to look at the enabling legislation, the enabling circumstances and put it in place to again ensure that this legislation is enforced and is enforced and is implemented within society. Talking to FIFA this week, they said they were in favor of an independent body overseeing the reforms in this country, that there was a need for an urgent solution. Is there likely to be an independent body? Is there likely to be an urgent solution? When can we expect 
these laws to change? That is a matter that you'll have to address to the Ministry of Labour. I'm not, uh, I'm not privy, or I'm not uh, privy, and I'm not a person who's who can answer that with any authority. But in terms of FIFA, they're a sporting organisation. They want an independent body overseeing it. They say there is a need for an urgent solution. Would you agree that there is a need for an urgent solution? I believe there's always a need for solutions in any aspects when it comes to, as I said, general reforms and general evolutions and developments. Uh, and that is what the country is doing. Now, in terms of the timelines, it has to be done uh, step by step in terms of ensuring that, again, it leaves a, it leaves a long-lasting legacy. It leaves a long-lasting impact on the country. Now, in terms of, as I said, what the government is doing, the government is taking its actions. As you've said, they've announced their reforms. Uh, they've announced uh, the commitment towards these reforms, and the announcements will be coming, I believe, shortly in terms of the kafala system and, and other aspects of I So you expect this to change very shortly, this year? From the announcements that the government has made, I believe it is, but you're probably re better placed in terms of the announcements and, uh, uh, than, than I am in terms of receiving them. But from what I understand, yes, the reforms or the changes will happen sometime this year. Uh, but in addition also, there's other uh, initiatives that the government is undertaking from what I'm aware of, uh, introducing more, uh, well, one, uh, accommodation standards are being introduced and being developed. Uh, two, I think uh, developing capacity for accommodation and actually offering capacity for accommodation within the, uh, general, uh, within the general marketplace. But more importantly, what I can talk about is us, the Supreme Committee, and the actions that we've taken and, the ac and similar actions that other organizations have also taken. We've established our, so our standards, the Supreme Committee standards. Before that, we've established a workers' charter, which actually developed the overall uh, vision uh, in terms of workers' welfare st uh, charter, uh, the overall vision that the Supreme Committee is committed to. Workers on the Al Wakra Stadium, that's one of the, the stadiums that's in the early stages of construction, they were talking last year saying their passports were still being held by their employers, which is against Qatari law, and they weren't being paid overtime. The contractor, the enabling contractor uh, that, that came on board, uh, we had our focus first and foremost was in terms of the accommodation standards and we imposed the accommodation standards and the health and safety standards upon them. And they embraced these standards, they developed them to a large extent and today, uh, I don't know if you had the opportunity to visit a Wakra uh, accommodation, but, I'm, but I believe everybody that's visited it has been impressed with the commitment that the contractor has shown. Not only did they deliver to our standards, but they started delivering it, even, delivering even more than what we were requ or requiring or asking for. So that was a great step forward, and that was a positive element. Now, of course, the standards, you know, there, there's going to be elements that we need to sit down and fix. Uh, in terms of the passport issue, uh, the passport issue, it wasn't the employers were holding it. Uh, we had actually, or, or the team that visited, had given the uh, employers, employees the options. Uh, to whether they hold the, op the uh, passports themselves or provide it to the employer uh, at their own volition. Isn't there not a better solution? There is a better solution, absolutely. But as, as I said, it's a, it's, it's, a work, it's a work in progress. We're sitting down working on delivering the stadiums, but at the same time ensuring that we deliver the standards. Our first priority, and, uh, and you know, I won't shirk away from this, our first priority was developing the accommodation standards. And I'm very proud to say that the standards that we got to today uh, are a benchmark. We just had a very constructive meeting with Human Rights Watch um, uh, last week, and we had the dis this sp specific discussion uh, as it relates to the passport, uh, uh, this pa passport retention, and there's been a number of solutions that we discussed with Human Rights Watch that we will be implementing very soon within our accommodation as well. So you can tell me if, if a worker came up to his employer today on a World Cup project and said, I want my passport, he would get it immediately. The contractor is obliged to deliver the passport, absolutely. And if that is not done, there is there there is means of communication with the Supreme Committee where every worker has the ability to raise that concern and we will ensure that the contractor and the empl and the employer not only delivers the passport to the to the employee that requires it, but also will be uh, will be punished as according in accordance with the law. As I Are said, the workers getting paid their overtime now because that that was one of their key complaints, wasn't it? They weren't simply weren't getting paid their that overtime. Ma that, that, that matter has been, has been, has been raised to us, as, as, you, as you correctly pointed out, and we're actually working with the contractors in terms of developing it, and if I'm not mistaken, I think it's implemented. This inter these interviews with the workers took place around a year ago. That seems quite a long time for an overtime payment to be made. The issue of the payment, as far as, I'm, as far as I'm aware, was in terms of the form and the way the form was set up and the way the calculation was made, and that has been resolved, and we're working with the contractors to ensure that the form itself is being developed in a manner to ensure that the uh, calculation is accurately reflected on the paper. So if we talk to the workers tomorrow, they'll be happy. They'll be getting paid their overtime. If you talk to the workers, they will be happy. And if they're not happy, 
come and raise it with us, and we will make sure that that gets, get, that, that gets fixed. The point is, again, and I want to be clear, we will never be able to f fix everything. You, know, you will go and you will find other issues that are problems in there. We're not making the claim that we've got the solution. We're not making the claim that our standards solve the issues. We're not making the claim that our workers' charters or even the efforts right now resolve all the issues. But we're committed. We're working hard towards doing that. We're putting effort in day in, day out, and we're, you know, towards, towards fixing that. And to the extent that there is mistakes, to the, to the extent that there are problems, we want that raised to us in a constructive manner. We ask, we welcome that to be raised to us in a constructive manner, rather than being, you know, a simple proof of saying, you see, you've done all this, that's great, but this is still a problem, so you see, that's, that's, that, that's the whole issue. And the focus is on the negative. Again, a balanced review on matters, we'll see that there's commitment, there's progress, but there's still a lot more work to be done and we're committed to delivering that work. What about exit permits? If, if an employer who's working on a 2022 project wants to leave the country, can he leave the country at a, at a time of his own choosing? Currently, you see, as, as, as much as it might seem, you know, people are working within the World Cup project, but there is rules and regulations as well currently in place uh, that you know, we have to abide by as well as much as anybody else has to abide by it. But at the same time, as far as it relates to the exit permits, there was also an announcement, I believe, last year in terms of part of the new uh, batch of changes that are coming along, which is a matter of dealing with the exit permits themselves. And in that matter, it's, you know, once these, these, uh, the system is put in place, uh, of course, all the employees and all the employers will have to abide by it. Amnesty International is saying that the only real way of protecting workers' rights is through reform of the kafala system, that the workers' charter is all well and good, but unless it's backed up by legislation, um, it's effectively meaningless. Does that mean that at the moment workers can still be trapped in the country? You see, I disagree with the fact that it's meaningless. Uh, to start off with, uh, the initiatives that the Supreme Committee is undertaking, along with other stakeholders as well, is quite significant. The results that we see on the ground are quite uh, impressive and, and more importantly they're quite uh, invigorating because you're seeing some you're seeing results on the ground now they're not the big bang results that people are expecting and we'll never make the uh, uh, we'll never be uh, arrogant enough to say the changes that we will make will be big bang and a big change throughout the world the change you know whether it's small or big is still change in a positive way forward now acknowledging the positive steps forward is a very important element it's a very important element because giving recognition to small change while also requesting bigger change means that you recognize the effort that's being put and you motivate people for even further to move towards the change. I just want to talk one final topic. Michael Garcia, probably the most famous American lawyer there's been in the last few months. Obviously the man who was brought in to investigate allegations of corruption surrounding the 2018 and 2022 bidding processes. His report, the summary of his report came out late last year seemed to clear Qatar of any serious wrongdoing. It looked to be a closed matter. Then, of course, he disowned the report as FIFA had published it, resigned from his position, and we're now awaiting uh, a legally appropriate extended version of that report to come out. Again, is that a frustration that something that seemed closed is now still an open issue? I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the matter is closed. It's not an open issue. The matter is actually resolved. The decision of Judge Eckhart is resolved. Uh, in terms of, asi aside from that point, uh, we are al we've always stated it and we will continue stating it. We are confident of our position. We have been very transparent and very open, whether it was during the discussions or during the interviews for the, tw as you correctly pointed out, the 2018-2022 bidding process and the investigation into all bidding nations. Uh, so we have been extremely transparent, extremely cooperative. Uh, with uh, Mr. Garcia and with every other entity that actually approached us. Despite the fact that the report that came out, I think, showcased very clearly that we, out of all, you know, we, at least ourselves as a 2022 Qatar bidding nation, extended all forms of cooperation uh, to the investigation itself, uh, the focus still seems to be somehow on us again. Um, I'll leave that uh, as just a general statement or an interesting observation. Having said that, we are confident... Do you think there's a, you think a prejudice a prejudice against Qatar? I can't say if there's a prejudice against Qatar. What I can say is there's a clear bias against us from the very beginning, from however you know, the approach was taken, from however stories get described. As I said, you know, as we just discussed right now, there's been great strides taken, for example, in our accommodation standards, and yet the focus is on the negatives. One other name I need to bring up is that of Mohammed bin Hammam, who for many reasons has become possibly the most famous football administrator to come from Qatar was at the very top table of 
the FIFA Executive Committee in 2010 at the time of the vote. Obviously, subsequently has been banned from all football related activity due to um, bribery charges uh, associated with his bid to become FIFA president. What was his relationship with Qatar 2022? We had to work very hard with all the EXCO members generally in terms of delivering our, our, or, or delivering the vision behind our bid. We had to work particularly hard with Mohammed bin Hammam early on. Uh, actually, I, I, it's safe to say we had to, I had to work harder with him than with other people as well who, were, who immediately recognized uh, the strong aspects of our bid. As I said, the, com the Compact World Cup, the legacy that we leave behind, the modular stadium. So he wasn't cetera, working cetera, on your behalf? Uh, Mohammed bin Hamam was not working on our behalf. After he got convinced, like other executive committee members, they were positive towards our bid. You know, but there were other ex there were ex executive committee members earlier on that actually were positive towards our bid, that understood the spirit behind our bid and the vision behind our bid before Mohammed bin Hamam. We had to work harder on him than, than, than on the other, the other executive committee members. How aware were you of what he was doing? Mohammed bin Hamam has been in the world of football long before any member of the bidding team got involved. He had his own goals, he had his own ambition, he had his own st strategy, he had his own vision. So to the, <laughs> it's safe to say I was not aware of his actions. Your own bid chairman described him as Qatar's biggest asset in the bid. Is that, is that not the case? Was that not the case? In terms of describing him, especially when you come closer to the, to the uh, vote, you have to understand when we came to the to, to you know to, to the bid. For example, you know when I met one of the first executive committee members, I had to sit down and talk to, and you know, or, or we tried to meet them to promote the bid. You know, the first question that they asked is, "Is your own executive committee member supporting your bid? Is Mohammed bin Hamam supporting your bid?" So you had to create the, the the fact that yes, he is supporting the bid because if he didn't, that would have been uh, a shot, you know, a, a gut shot towards our bid. It was a bidding strategy. So as we moved along, we started promoting, you know, the fact that yes. Uh, Mohammed bin Hammam support uh, or is in favor of the bid. It was a strategy towards delivering it. And when the statement, as you said, the chairman had made, it was very clearly made in terms of you know delivering a message to the world that yes, he is supporting the bid. So that as we get closer to the you know to, to the to the vote, there is no doubt, there's no gnawing doubt in people's minds that the exco member from Qatar is not supporting the bid. It was a simple. So how, was a how simple shocked were you strategy. by how shocked were you by what subsequently happened and? his subsequent ban from, from all footballing activity. You see, I'm not, I'm not fully aware of the details of, of everything that happened, uh, you know, in terms of where he got to or, or, or the significant decisions that happened. What I can say is, you know, it was simple. There was an accusation, there was investigation, there was a, an appeal, then there was a further investigation to other activities and there was a decision that was made. For us, that was the end of it. And, you know, again, that was a matter relating to FIFA and FIFA politics. We are focusing on delivering the World Cup. Our work is on delivering the World Cup and making sure that this World Cup is the most significant, is the most impactful World Cup in history. And I'll tell you something, there is a very, very, this World Cup is, is, is an opportunity. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. I strongly believe that and I truly believe that. There is no uniting force out there that has that impact on a global stage like football as a sport and like the World Cup as an event. It's a uniting platform in every shape and form. And you see it many different times. You've seen it throughout history many different times. And the one that for us rings a bell and was inspiring to us was the 2007 Asian Cup when Iraq won. For one day, for one day, you had a warring nation celebrating together that success and that victory. Now, if that's not powerful, you'll have to tell me what else is powerful. There is that very, very strong power that comes out of it, a very strong unifying power. And today, in the Middle East, throughout the globe, we need to subscribe to these kinds of events. We need to subscribe to these kinds of platforms and support it, and support it fully towards ensuring that what we do is stop polarizing the world. Look at, you look at events that actually bring people together instead of polarizing them, instead of finding extremes and finding issues on outliers and making them the, the common rule. We need to make sure that these are the exceptions. And what is the common rule is that unifying platform, that power that the World Cup has. We're committed to that vision. We're working towards that vision. We're working gradually towards delivering on that vision. Hassan al Fawari, Secretary General of the Supreme Committee, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank, thank you so you much. much. Thank you. Thanks for your Thank you very much.